Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Stephen Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist and today we have our latest installment in my Essential Differential series and that is the Essential Differential for Disquamative Gingivitis. But first, we gotta get into that disclaimer, and that is that all the, the views expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any of the organizations that employ me or that I may belong to, and that also this video is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as medical advice, and should you have any questions about your oral or systemic healthcare, please see your nearest healthcare provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. On this latest installment on my Essential Differential series, rest of the series up there, we'll be talking about disquamative gingivitis. Now, disquamative gingivitis is a very specific presentation that we see in our practice. We see these patients that come in with this very red gingiva that is very friable, friable meaning that it kind of falls apart like soil. So as soon as you touch it, the surface of the gingiva just kind of pulls away and is left with a very bloody surface. That is disquamative gingivitis. Disquamative gingivitis is often very, very uncomfortable for the patients, understandably, as you can appreciate from that picture. Patients often can't brush their teeth because of how sore their gums are. So they often have a lot of plaque and calculus buildup just because every time they brush their teeth, they're extremely uncomfortable and then they're sink fills with blood. There are three kind of main things that we think about when we see disquamative gingivitis. The first is lichen planus. Lichen planus is an inflammatory condition that can affect really any surface in the oral mucosa. Classically, we see it on the bilateral buccal mucosa and it comes in kind of three different forms. The reticular form, where we see really nice lacy white lines, the atrophic form, where we see kind of this redness and, and erythema, and the ulcerative or erosive form, where ulcers form. But the initial presentation of lichen planus occasionally is disquamative gingivitis. And many patients that have disquamative gingivitis in the context of lichen planus have other lichenoid lesions in their oral cavity. For instance, that picture that I used as the example of disquamative gingivitis that patient had bilateral, atrophic, and reticular lesions of the posterior buccal mucosa, which you can see here. That made it easier for me to diagnose lichen planus without having to do further workup and be able to treat appropriately. Lichen planus is a chronic condition and it can wax and wane, meaning patients can have flares where the disease is very present and very bothersome, and then they can also have area times of remission where the uh, condition has waned and they are comfortable. There are a variety of options for treatment for lichen planus. The one that I like to use in my practice is a topical steroid gel. The gel formulation works best in the oral cavity. Many times an ointment or a cream is just kind of thick and doesn't stick and do the job like a gel would. The gel has much better patient compliance. There's also systemic treatments as well, including systemic steroids, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and even doxycycline at a low dose. Doxycycline at a low dose isn't acting as an antibiotic. Instead, it's acting as a matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor. This decreases the inflammation and helps patients have a longer distance between their flares a more long-standing remission, and oftentimes if they have a flare, it's less severe. Lichen planus can affect other areas as well, including genital and anal mucosa. It can also affect the skin. Classically, it's the four Ps of the purple polygonal paritic papule, often seen in the flexor surfaces of the wrist, elbow, or knees, but sometimes patients don't have any involvement outside of the oral cavity. In fact, most patients in my practice don't have skin involvement, but occasionally they do, and that's why I always make sure that I ask if they have any rashes anywhere else on their skin, genital, or anal mucosa. Lichen planus on biopsy under the microscope is going to show this kind of saw-toothing reedy ridges where the epithelium kind of looks like the teeth of a saw, a lymphocytic band, meaning this really dense area of lymphocytes, sometimes an eosinophilic or red outline to the basement membrane around those saw teeth, 
and then exocytosis, where we see inflammatory cells in the epithelium. Lichen planus in any of its forms, even dysquamnogingivitis, is exceedingly common in my practice and is by far one of the most common things that I treat and manage. There is a kind of controversial area in lichen planus, and that is whether or not there's malignant transformation. There are kind of two camps. The one that believes that lichen planus is truly a pre-malignant lesion and that less than 1% of patients with lichen planus will go on to develop oral squamous cell carcinoma. And another that suggests that lichen planus is not pre-malignant, but actually misdiagnosed as a dysplastic lesion with inflammation. Now, I don't really have strong feelings either way, but I do know that there are patients that look like lichen planus that may develop oral cancer. That's why even after I manage the patient's initial discomfort, I make sure that I follow these patients long-term every six months to one year. That way, if there is any transformation, I can catch it early. And if they get any flares, I'm ready to go to initiate treatment again. The next entity in our differential diagnosis is mucous membrane pemphigoid. Now, mucous membrane pemphigoid is an autoimmune condition, meaning that our body is producing antibodies that attacks itself, autoimmune, self-immunity. Now, we know that antibodies in the context of disease are actually very helpful. They help fight off viruses and bacteria and other invaders from causing us to be sick. But in autoimmunity, these antibodies are produced against our own cells and can cause damage. Pemphigoid clinically in the oral cavity often presents as a disquamative gingivitis without lesions elsewhere. Occasionally, we do see lesions outside of the gingiva, and they can present as either ulcerations or bulla, meaning kind of fluid-filled bumps that we see in the oral cavity. The reason why we see these bumps is because of the histology. The antibodies attack the epithelium at the basement membrane. They attack under the basement layer at the hemidesmosomes. This creates a sub-epithelial split where the surface is completely separated from the underlying connective tissue. This creates that bubble or that fluid-filled vesicle that we see clinically. The difficulty with this diagnosis is that sometimes when we get biopsies that aren't pemphigoid, we can see that split as well. So this instance of our h &E or traditional staining, we can only really suggest pemphigoid and say that we're suspicious for it. The best way to diagnose pemphigoid is on direct immunofluorescence. Direct immunofluorescence is a special type of microscopy that uses a special type of microscope and a special type of staining. If you need to review different types of immunohistochemistry and direct immunofluorescence, I highly suggest before you watch the remainder of this video to watch my video where I recap and kind of fully explain what this staining looks like. Direct immunofluorescence uses the patient's antibodies as targets. So we're able to label where the patient's own antibodies are targeted within the context of that biopsy. These labels glow in the dark, which makes it very easy for us to identify where the patient's antibodies are attacking their tissue. This requires a biopsy of perilesional tissue. That means not an area of the vesicle or fluid-filled bump itself, not an area of ulcer, but an area right next door to it. This also requires that the tissue is put in a special solution called Michelle solution, which only allows the tissue to be examined in the next two or three days or is examined fresh immediately. If the tissue is placed in formalin, all of the patient's own antibodies wash away and the test is useless. When we look at the direct immunofluorescence for mucous membrane pemphigoid, we see a deposit of the patient's own antibodies at the basement membrane zone. That's gonna give us a nice green glow-in-the-dark line between the epithelium and the connective tissue. Just like I explained where the antibodies attack, we can highlight those attacking antibodies on direct immunofluorescence, which you can see here. For those of you that are a little bit more advanced, maybe we have a few oral pathologists or general pathologists or dermatologists watching this video, those antibodies are typically IgG and C3 at the basement membrane. 
Occasionally we do see linear IgA disease, but typically the patients have a diagnosis prior and instead of IgG or C3, we see IgA deposited at the basement membrane. If that sounded like complete mumbo jumbo, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that my video reaches as many different audiences as it can, including people that don't have a medical background and people that do have a medical background that are interested in a little bit more information deeper down the rabbit hole. Mucous membrane pemphigoid is treated somewhat similarly in my practice with uh, topical steroid gel and occasionally the doxycycline. Sometimes we have to involve systemic treatments. I know some of my colleagues like to use Dapsone, uh, but I usually find some success with topical steroid treatment. Similarly to lichen planus, mucous membrane pemphigoid can have skin lesions. Ocular involvement often presents as symblepharon. Symblephron is when the mucosa of the eyelid or palpebral conjunctiva and the eye itself or the ocular global or bulbar conjunctiva be becomes attached with kind of like a scar. And eventually over time there might be such significant scarring and closure that the patient becomes blind. That's why if we ever make a diagnosis of mucous membrane pemphigoid, we always refer the patient to an ocular specialist that is familiar with that condition. The last entity on our essential differential is pemphigus vulgaris. Pemphigus vulgaris is also an autoimmune condition, but rather than attacking the hemidesmosomes at the basal layer, it attacks the desmosomes within the epithelium itself. More than 50% of patients with pemphigus vulgaris will have oral lesions. And we often say that the oral lesions are the first to show and the last to go. Not all patients will develop skin lesions, but many do. And the autoantibodies or antibodies that attack our own cells in this condition are desmoglein 1 and 3, or DSG 1 and 3. Now getting lab values or serology in the blood to, to track the level of DSG 1 and 3 is actually very helpful for two different reasons. The first being it can help us establish a diagnosis. If patients have elevated DSG 1 and 3, we know that they have pemphigus. It's also really helpful because it can track treatment results. So as the patient gets better, we'll see a decrease in the levels of DSG-1 and 3 in the patient's blood. Pemphigus can present as desquamative gingivitis, but oftentimes there's a lot of involvement outside of it. These patients are in an extreme amount of discomfort. And in fact, many of these patients I've encountered through the emergency department or actually admitted to the floors. When we do a traditional biopsy in these patients, we see suprabasilar acantholysis. Now, what does that mean? That means that the epithelium is splitting above the basal cell layer. This leaves kind of like a tombstone or a picket fence where the basal cells are left behind, but the rest of the epithelium pulls away. Direct immunofluorescence of perilesional tissue that is either processed fresh or in Michelle's solution shows a chicken wire pattern where instead of having a nice line at the basement membrane zone, we have this kind of wired pattern within the epithelium surrounding the individual epithelial cells. Again, for those that are more familiar with DIF, this is IgG and C3. How is this treated? Well, this requires high dose systemic steroids. Before the invention of systemic steroids, many of these patients did die of their disease, but now we find that we are able to manage most of it. Some of these patients do have some tenacious areas that don't respond to treatment, but most patients get to a level where they are entirely comfortable and able to live their full and happy life. A more new therapy is rituximab. This is a monoclonal antibody against CD20 B cells. These are inflammatory cells that might be creating these autoantibodies or signals that lead to autoantibody production and leading to pemphigus. We do find that rituximab infusion therapy works very well in these patients. A few last points. In the mucous membrane pemphigoid, there are blood studies that we can use, uh, specifically the antibodies BP180 and 230. However, these are better, better in skin disease, bullous pemphigoid, and may or may not be helpful in the management of oral mucous membrane pemphigoid. The other thing too is it's not a helpful measure of 
treatment eff efficacy like in Pemphigus. So we do it, but typically it's not too helpful. And what happens if you do DIF on lichen planus? Well, it's not really so specific, but similarly to pemphigoid, we see a line of antibody deposition at the basement membrane zone of fibrinogen, but it's not always so specific. So oftentimes the traditional biopsy is what's most helpful. You'll also hear about Nikolsky sign, which is very helpful in skin vesiculoerosive diseases, but in the oral cavity, it's often positive and nonspecific. The Nikolsky sign is when we rub a little area of affected or close to affected tissue, and it creates kind of a blister or sloughing. And in these patients, most of the time it's positive, and most of the time it's just really uncomfortable, so it doesn't really mean much. That's our deep dive into the essential differential into disquamative gingivitis. I know that this was a little bit more complex than some of my other videos have been in the past. I wanted to make sure that I did each of these entities justice because they all are very different and have very important differences that are clinically relevant, even though they can all present the same as disquamative gingivitis. I really appreciate you watching this and all of my other videos. If you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. Check out the rest of my essential differential videos. Give this video a like and share it with someone else that might like it as well. Thanks again for watching and be well.